Welcome to E-Commerce Conversations, a podcast by Practical E-Commerce. What's going on, Internet? Eric Reynolds back again with another E-Commerce Conversations. Hope all is going well on the other side of the Internet. On the other side of the table from me, I've got an old friend, Mr. Paul. Paul with BK Beauty. Welcome back. Thanks for having me, Eric. Excited uh, to be back in the chair with you. And congrats on 10 years. Beard oh, brand. yeah. That's yeah. amazing. 10 years, man. That's like a quarter of my life. Yeah. Think about it that way. Well, it's the tundra here. So I uh, thank you for braving the icy roads to come out to the Beard Brand office and yeah. kind of give some updates. I'm super stoked for this chat because you're one of the few people who wasn't impacted by Facebook ads at all, right? It didn't affect us. I would say last year uh, it was on the roadmap as kind of any emerging brands, you, you got to look to page social. I mean, that was the mindset prior to last year. Certainly it was part of our growth plan to s- expand out from what we we're doing on organic sales side. We started running some tests early in the year and started scaling up pretty quickly because we we're being able to measure some success in terms of, you know, getting a targeted row as by just really doing minimal effort, throwing up ads and kind of getting our targeting going. Um, we scaled it up through March, going up to like 50K a month. I mean, we just saw success and just put more coins in and get more customers out. Things started getting rocky and the reporting just wasn't kind of giving me confidence. And so we didn't need it. We pulled the plug and we decided to double down on what was working for us and, and revisit paid social. When did you pull the plug? I want to say it was end of April. Oh, so so like really early, like right around when the iOS switch happened. Yeah. I mean, I keep my ear to the ground. I talked to a lot of other owner operators. You know, there was a lot of dust that needed to settle, a lot of questions going out. I just didn't want to kind of get into the mix at that time. And so we maybe could have made it work, but it was a distraction. Uh, I wanted to to focus elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, we kind of had the same problem. We had a James, our growth marketer, was working with us, and he was doing a good job of scaling up. We got up to like 120K yeah. a month, something like that. And then he left in August or around August, and then we started like looking at the numbers, and we're like, we're just giving Zuckerberg money, right. and he's not doing any anything in return. Yeah, and I think yeah, like yeah. in 2021, we ended up blowing like a half million dollars. Jesus, yeah. On uh, yeah. paid ads. It's very easy to do sales. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we spent 120K to drive 120K in sales. Right. And then when you figure in your cogs and stuff like that, yeah, it's not pretty. Yeah. So for us, you know, we tried it. We were able to acquire customers profitably, but it just wasn't the ROI that I, I really wanted to see. And on top of that, the customers coming in, they really didn't have the connection with the brands, you know, because we were focused primarily on just cold prospecting, right? So folks who maybe never visit our website, never had a touch point with our brand. I was noticing that customer service emails were ticking up. Oh yeah. Our return rate was relatively, has always been low. It's it's just under 2%, but I was seeing that starting to creep up. And so these were customers that we were- The reviews go down too, like the, yeah. the star rating on your website. We noticed that too. Yeah. And so there's just all these signs. They weren't the ideal customers I wanted to be bringing into the fold early. And there was other opportunities to double down that we had in front of us that I wanted to focus on and just tell stories from the brand. We did some brand partnerships, some product collaborations. Affiliate marketing is kind of at the core of working with content creators on YouTube. And that that was really our first flywheel and still is today. And so doubling down on all those efforts on the organic side, putting out content, working with content creators. Again, we'll revisit paid social, paid acquisition, but for the time being, we're we're putting it in the parking lot. Yeah. I think the challenge for small businesses like ours is, you know, you get on the bandwagon. We were talking about this before we hit record, but it was just, you got to be on paid social, right? Paid social media. That's what everyone does. So, you know, I tried that, lost a bunch of money. You tried that, wasn't going the right direction you wanted. And you kind of think like, well, there's no other way to grow a business. Mm -hmm. Like, how do I grow my business if I can't do Facebook ads? And the reality is there's a lot of ways to grow your business. Right. So you guys launched the affiliate program. When did y'all launch that? Did you already have that up and running? So we looked to set up affiliate pretty early and a little bit of context for folks who aren't as familiar with our brand. 
So we launched in August of 2019, but prior to that, our story really started many years before that. My wife had a YouTube channel, developed an audience, and so she and I, through watching what she did growing that audience on YouTube for about eight years, she was working with brand partnerships, doing affiliate links in her description box below, of, you know, talking about the products she loves. And so we had a good deal of insight into the mindset and motivation of the content creators out there and how to operate in their world because we were coming from that space. And affiliate programs are just part of, at least in our category, makeup and cosmetics. Um, content creators on YouTube talking about the products they love are able to do what they do because of you know monetizing through commission and affiliate links to the products they sell or talk about. Uh, brand partnerships, and then YouTube ad revenue share, right? And so on the affiliate side, right after launch, we had a number of other YouTubers who my wife had relationships with, friends of hers who supported the brand, supported the launch. And ultimately, we felt as though we wanted to expand what we were doing there and deliver some form of compensation to them for the product sales that they were generating. And so setting up our own affiliate program was part of that plan. For us, we looked to the ecosystem of affiliate that my wife was living in, in her content creation side of the business. And she found herself and the other folks in our category typically use something called reward style, which is a sub affiliate network. And I didn't know much about the space. I was learning about kind of how to set up an affiliate program, but I knew I needed to be on reward style because that is where the folks who we wanted to engage with were operating their, their business from. And so I reached out to Reward Style to get more information on how to get spun up with their network. And they pointed me to other affiliate platforms that had to be the primary platform. Oh, weird. Yeah. So how sub-affiliate networks work is they piggyback off of primary platforms. Primary ones are, there's several of them. Share a sale is one. That's the one we're on. Commission Junction. And there's an array of other ones. And so immediately when I reached out to Reward Style, they say, okay, we're happy to bring you on into the fold, but these are the steps you need to take to get onboarded with our platform. Step one, you need to sign up for an affiliate platform. And I was like, what? I thought you were an affiliate platform. Yeah. I mean, all that stuff is like kind of confusing to me because we just launched our affiliate program as well. We're with Avant Link, I guess. And hopefully there's a lot of creators on that platform where you can just kind of like mass blast a, a campaign to kind of bring engagement and awareness. How do you even like... I mean, you guys kind of have that inside information because you're creating content. If you're selling, you know, widgets, how do you find the right affiliate program? I know on like Shopify, there's always, you know, like Refersion or just kind of like these generic platforms where I guess they're all kind of independent or are they networks as well? Like, I don't get it. Like, are you looking for affiliate programs that have a network or just the software or... So the way I view affiliate networks and platforms, they really just take care of the back office and the transactional nature of the relationship between you and your affiliates, right? Payouts, reporting, link tracking, like that's what they bring to the table. I didn't go into our relationship with our affiliate program with the thought that they would be bringing creators or relationships to us. Okay. Certainly reward style and other sub affiliate magic links is another one in our category that focuses on beauty, lifestyle, makeup, fashion. They do have kind of pay to play programs where they will connect you with paid sponsorships, the influencers and creators under their network. We never played in that arena. We always sourced our own relationships and we continue to do so today. And so what we strive for is developing just real human relationships. At the end of the day, these content creators, they're not a business on the other end. They're people. Right. This is a human to human relationship that you're developing. And the more authentic you can be, at least this is my view, the more authentic you can be with that relationship, sharing your, you know, we do a lot of product seeding, right? right. And so that's part of our strategy. That comes even way before the affiliate program starts. And so we get introduced to new content creators. Maybe they've heard about us. Maybe we see that they purchased a product from us. And then we very quickly, you know, have our feelers out. We see that and we reach out proactively and, you know, make their day, send them the rest of our collection, you know, issue a custom branded 10% discount code that they can share with their audience if they'd like. And no expectations any sort of expectation of content creation as it relates to our brand or our products, 
just enjoy, right? And so more often than not, they use the products, they love it, they talk about it. And then once they do, we introduce them to the affiliate program and just mention, hey, by the way, if you do like them, if you do share them, we have a 15% off commission through share a sale, reward sale. You know, you look in their description box and you see what platforms they're on and you just make sure that you're on there and you yeah. point them in the right direction. So let's talk about costs. Like how much cut are these platforms taken? When we were looking at it, some of them required like exclusivity versus being on multiple platforms. Is there a commission that they're taking as well? And then what is a good strategy for the creators? You know, how much commission should they get? And then the third question, this is a triple question. Do you offer them like a discount code for them to offer to their audience as well? So I'll start with the last one. The answer is yes. And so we typically issue a 10% discount code to the creators. They can include it. They can reference it in their, their videos. Again, we're typically found amongst YouTube content creators at this point. That's our kind of radical focus. To go back in terms of cost for the platform cost, our commission structure, and how we design and manage the program, the cost to our primary, I'll break it out kind of working backwards from that primary platform for us that share a sale, right? So primary platforms, when you're evaluating which one to go with, what I've found is they're all pretty much priced similar. They just look at it at different angles. So for example, commission junction versus a share a sale, right? There may be some difference in terms of their real-time reporting, you know, the UI, a lot of the mechanics of operating the platform. But at the end of the day, they offer very similar outcomes and value. The way that they structure their pricing, share a sale, which we're on, they take a 20% cut of any payouts, right? And so we're running a 15% commission, right? And so let's say... So it's so $100, you pay 15%, which would be 15 bucks. That goes to the creator. And then you pay 20%. Yeah, so $3. $3. Yeah. So it would be essentially 3%. 3%, that's correct. And so if you look at Commission Junction, which is another primary affiliate platform, the way they do it is they just do a 3% off of total affiliate sales. Yeah. So, so it's the, the same thing. It's just... It's the same thing assuming that your program is at 15% commission. Yeah. Right? And so if you're running a higher end program where you're paying out 20, 30%, maybe you're very aggressive on this front. At that point, one of them would be, it would be more advantageous yeah. to go with, with the other. So I've been pretty happy with share a sale, diving in out of the gate, setting it up. I looked at their UI, like it was very kludgy. It looked like it was just a hackathon project. But as I started using it more, like the tool is extremely powerful in terms of how granular you can get. And then... That leads me to the, the sub-affiliate networks, Reward Style and Share a Sale. They're basically piggybacking off of our primary. And so they have their network, their circle of influencers. And what they provide them is consolidation of how they can run their business from the affiliate, you know, generating affiliate links, getting payouts, reporting. They also offer brand partnership opportunities. And so typically creators who are monetizing their content with affiliate programs will, for the most part, operate in a single ecosystem. Yeah, they don't want to be getting 20 different checks. They don't. I mean, that's what my wife does. Now, that said, the sub-affiliate networks, the reward styles and the magic links, they do take another cut mm -hmm. of the actual creator's payout, which is kind of crazy. And so if the same creator were to sign up directly through our share a sale program, they would be getting full... 15%. Whereas if they signed up under reward style, reward style is taking a rake mm -hmm. and it can be up to 20, 30, oh, wow. 40% of their payout. A lot of creators just are not aware. Those sub affiliate networks, they're not taking money from the brand. They're taking a rake of the payout. Oh, wow. Yeah. So they're paying for that convenience of having like a single platform. A question I had is the strategy. Why did you decide to do a 15% commission plus a 10% coupon versus a 25% commission and no coupon? That's a good point. So we have coupon codes out there for 10%. That's just kind of our baseline. If someone were hungry and they wanted to hit the Google and find a discount code like many people do, they could probably find an active 10% or out there. Yeah. And so it was just par for the course. It provides the creators a branded discount code to drive people towards. It allows them to you know, have an opportunity to tell that story and, and offer it to their audience. 
So we felt as though there was value there. In terms of the 15% commission, it's where we landed just based off of, um, at the end of the day, the content creators that are supporting our brand, like we want to make sure that we are giving them a fair deal of compensation. I mean, this is, this is really what is driving the engine of our business. I think 15% is a good middle ground in terms of commissions. You know, it's interesting because like Beard Brand tends to be like a no discount code brand. And 10 years in, we're still kind of the same way. We do promotions and bundles and stuff like that. But I was talking to one of my blogger buddies. I was like, hey, man, is it better to give you a code? And now he's a blogger, not a YouTuber. Is it better to give you a code or a higher commission? He's like, give me a higher commission because then when I write about this, it doesn't seem like a sponsored post. Mm -hmm. You know, like I can put that affiliate link in there. Say it's an affiliate link, but when you're like, hey, use this code to get 10% off, then all of a sudden the content, it seems less authentic. Right. Now, every audience is different. Like I feel like in your market, that's probably par for the course. Like everybody does it. Mm -hmm. So there's not that, you know, level of distrust. But I think, you know, that's something to take into consideration where you might be able to get, you know, creators talking about your products more and more authentically without the code by giving them a higher commission. Maybe, maybe not. That's something to test. So what is the expectation for the amount of people you can bring on board? And are you only doing YouTubers or are you doing bloggers and other interesting? So I'm a big believer in radical focus. And so what's worked really well for our specific product in our category, it's YouTube, it's video, it's educational content, right? Makeup tutorials, product reviews. And so YouTube has really been a great place for us in terms of driving sales. We've worked with influencers, quote unquote, on Instagram, where they're putting out pretty photos. And some of them have very, very big followings. And YouTube, man, it just drives so much more for our, our specific product. I think our approach, again, driving for that deep relationship where there's a very high level of authenticity in terms of you can tell when you're looking at someone on video using and talking about a product that they actually love. Mm -hmm. There's no other way to do it outside of a video and long form video on top of that, it just provides such a better way to capture human authenticity. And so again, our affiliate commissions, our affiliate program is kind of tangential to really the core program, which is getting our products into the hands of people who love them and have an audience to share them with. Yeah. So how big, I mean, I got to imagine there's a point where there's just no more creators, right? Like how many affiliates can you bring on? Like 20 of them, 50 of them, or? So I would say on a daily basis, there is about, at least today, about a dozen videos per day of creators that we're working with who are continuing to use our product. What's interesting about our products and what works well is we started with makeup brushes. What's unique about makeup brushes when it comes to YouTube videos and working in that ecosystem is our brushes can either be a featured star in the video or a supporting cast member, right? And so maybe the YouTuber is talking about the brand new, you know, Charlotte Tilbury, you know, right. eyeshadow palette, and they're using a BK Beauty brush. And so it's more of a supporting cast member. And so we have these recurring touch points over time. And so how many of them are there out there? You would be very surprised. Like, I feel as though there's no way we could exhaust that list. Oh, really? I just don't feel it's possible. What we're working on right now is to systematize and really get, you know, we started off a little more opportunistic and really kind of just letting it evolve organically. This year, we're really putting in place kind of dedicated, you know, systems and programs to manage those relationships because once you get to scale, and I think right now it's, it's over 100 folks who we're working with or have, you know, have some level of engagement with, um, once you get beyond that, it's very difficult to manage those relationships and so looking to kind of traditional CRMs and just managing those relationships over time is what we're looking at. So you've got about 100 affiliates who you're working with, all YouTubers. Yeah, so it's interesting. So And all in the beauty space? All in the beauty space. Yeah. And so again, with our sub-affiliate networks, those reward styles, that just taps us into just a huge swath of anyone could have access to use our codes if they're working under reward style, right? Yeah. I will say outside of YouTube, we do get a lot of just directly through share a sale. There's a lot of people who apply to our program, a lot of coupon sites. I'm not yeah. sure if you're seeing that. Well, yeah, this is a warning that I want to give out to people like so coupon sites and quote unquote, like review sites, 
they're essentially stealing money from right. you. Yeah. Because what happens is you have a customer who's ready to buy and then they Google, you know, like BK Beauty coupon and then they find the coupon store and then that store did nothing to drive any business to you. And then they're just essentially snaking your affiliate commission. So yeah, even beyond that, I view it, they're stealing money from our content creators and mm -hmm. our affiliates, because at the end of the day, those are the people doing the work. Right. Whereas these coupon sites are just man in the middle, right before transactions, just swooping in and basically taking chips off the table. And so I'm very diligent in just kind of squashing those, getting them out. There was actually, you know, I, I don't approve them very selective on who we bring into our program for that reason and many others. There was one, um, Skim Links is another kind of sub affiliate and they partner with publications. And so like, I mean, that's, that's their pitch. You go, yeah. to, go to their website. Oh, you know, we work with Vogue, we work with blah, blah, blah. And this is how they can get access. Maybe they're doing like a listicle write up or, and they're using affiliate links. And so reached out kind of Skim Links is one of the sub affiliates on our program. And I saw that they started generating sales. I started looking, kind of diving in the weeds and seeing that they were sending us coupon site. Oh, really? Yeah. And so I was like, what the hell is going on? And so I cut them off. I manually took their commission down to zero. And I was like, listen, like, I'm just going to put it zero and see if they raise a flag and we can talk about it. Yeah. So I took them to zero. They reached out, you know, several months later and I go, hey, and before doing that, I updated my program's terms of use and just kind of what we set out. And I clearly laid out, we do not work with coupon sites or any, you know, kind of detailed that. Yeah. And so I pointed that to them and I said, hey, listen, you know, you're in violation of our program's policy. We see you're driving a lot of coupon related sites. You know, you advertise that you work primarily with major publications. If you can correct that, we're happy to, you know, bring you back in the fold. And I was not expecting them to be able to do that. And they basically filtered out all the junk. Oh, really? And then they're like, yeah, we can do that for you. I was like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> so you got to be very careful. Even legitimate ones will kind of backdoor some of these unwanted folks that are, you know, like you described. And so since then, through Skim Links, we had Vogue picked us up. We were in Vogue twice using our affiliate links. What's very surprising is while there's definitely a cool factor associated with that, it's not driving sales close to what you know youtube and working with oh, content yeah, yeah. creators the, the, those old school publications like they're just riding on their clout from 50 years ago but i still love it that was cool yeah so i did a little rant about affiliate marketers who i feel are at the bottom of the totem pole for me when they're just purely you know like you have a review website and they're all affiliate links for amazon there's a difference between like an affiliate marketer and a person who uses affiliate links to generate revenue. And I think what you want to do, in my opinion, is avoid those affiliate marketers who just every single link is an affiliate link. There's no real journalism or reviews or authenticity. They're written by someone, you know, whose English is not their first language. And they're just trying to generate revenue versus someone who's like bought into the space or bought into the content they're creating. And you know, has a name and a brand that they want to stand behind. So anyways, that's kind of like a little rant for me. Yeah, totally. And I, I view it the same way. Our affiliate program and affiliate marketing for us, it's not at the heart of why that program exists within our brand, right? That program exists to support the content creators that are providing education, that are sharing the products that we put out that they love with their audience. And this is just basically functionally allowing us to have and support their content through commissions. And I view that as not necessarily a transactional relationship, right? Whereas if I pay you to produce this content that, you know, a sponsored video, sponsored post, that's a very transactional relationship. Yeah. I think what that leads to is just not what we're looking for. You lose the authenticity at that point. You know, that was something that we considered when we just rolled out our affiliate program like a month ago. It was like, we gave creators an option. It's like, hey, we can do a sponsored post. We'll pay 2x whatever your revenue per thousand is. Or we can do an affiliate one. And it just like the compensation of like the 2x revenue per thousand confused the heck out of them. They're just used to like, ah, oh, my video is worth 2,000 bucks or 5,000 bucks. And, and then it was just like, you know, you get into this negotiation thing and how much are they worth? And it's just like, you kind of start the relationship with friction. Whereas like affiliates just like, hey, I want to just pay you 
or anything you drive and if you love the product so we just killed any kind of sponsorships like we're just not doing that anymore and it's like 100 percent affiliate and i feel like it's just a simpler message and then for people who are looking for sponsored content you know they can go to a different brand but i feel like most creators know that some are affiliates and some are sponsored and some are adsense you know yeah and for us again and what you're describing is really retaining that deep relationship and that relationship building with these content creators. And I think that that leads to so much more value long-term. And I'll walk you through kind of a few steps the way I see it and the way that we've kind of done it last year. But for us, having the affiliate program in place, yes, it's a way you can support the good content that folks are putting out that are driving sales and supporting your business as well. But beyond that, it gives us insight into who is actually moving the needle the most, right? What creators out there have a deep affinity for our brand and a really high engagement level with their audience? What that led us to do last year is identify one of the top affiliates that's driving a lot of our sales. We see all our videos, like there's so much brand alignment. There's so much just natural integration with their audience, my wife's audience. And it's just kind of one of these just magical things that, that came about. And so we approached her to do a product collaboration as kind of a next step mm -hmm. to kind of advance the relationship beyond just an affiliate program and, and seeding product and sharing it with her. And so we went through the process. It took us about two years to develop that product. We launched it last year and it just, it blew up within three months. I mean, we were already in seven figure territory for that one wow. product. And so partnerships is another big thing. And again, our affiliate program, it's a part of a bigger Play. So hold on, let's dig into that a little yep. bit because what kind of revenue were they driving seven figures of revenue beforehand? Like this collaboration, was that totally outside of your expectations or is that kind of what you expected? It definitely exceeded our expectations. I wouldn't say that they were driving seven figures alone at yeah. all, our core products. I'm sure you've seen it being a personality on YouTube, coming from, you know, having that in your DNA as well. My wife and I, we saw it when we launched our brand and our products. There's just this, again, going back to that authenticity, that affinity that the audience has, and you bring something you love and you've worked on so long to market and you're developing, you know, it's, it's a physical good, but it's imbued with all these attributes and elements and you have story around it and you're putting out content and education. And so this was just, you know, what we experienced when we launched our brand, this was a mini version of that that our content creator partner on the product collab, what they got to experience more closely with their audience too. And we just helped facilitated that process. Her channel's bigger, her audience is bigger. So it was just a bigger platform to have a release. And going into next year, we're already looking at doing more partnerships, yeah. and partner collabs. Now, someone who's on the fence of getting into affiliate programs, you know, what is realistically how much can they drive? I mean, the beauty of affiliates to me is like, you know, we know our costs. It's going to be, you know, 25% customer acquisition costs or whatever your commissions are and the fees are. So you kind of know every single order can be profitable depending on those rates that you have. But like how much business can an affiliate program drive or how long will it take to drive that kind of revenue? I think every business is unique. Every category is unique. I can tell you what we experience. So for us, affiliate drives 20% of our sales. A lot of that is new customer acquisition. And of course, the lifetime value of those new customers coming in, you can expand out from there. But again, we seek and develop the relationships with our affiliates and own those ourselves. And so it's really just a function of us going back to what we're working on now, systematizing the outreach, systematizing the you know, relationship building and managing that relationship over time. And I mentioned in our category, there's just so many content creators focusing on beauty and makeup. Honestly, it is endless. Yeah. We focus and we see a lot of great results finding and identifying folks when they're a little smaller channel. And what so, is smaller? So for us, we'll reach out and engage and, and seed product to folks who maybe only have two to 5,000 subscribers. But really kind of the sweet spot for us is that 10 to... 50, I would okay. say. That's really when, at least for us in our experience, you get to have an early touch point with a content creator before they've really started to see their business as, again, going to that transactional mindset. And so you can come in early 
give them a lot of attention and help develop their channel by supporting them through commissions, sending them products, and just develop that relationship early. I found once you start approaching folks, if you don't have kind of a direct line in and it's just kind of a cold outreach, when they're beyond, yeah, you know, you get into the, the managers, you get the managers, just it's very difficult to crack in and have that personal touch. Yeah. Yeah. And so for us, it's just about expanding what we're doing and mashing the throttle down on that. And I think there's, a, I mean, 20% right now, it makes up our business. I could see that going up as we continue to be more proactive and, and building systems to do more. Yeah. I think we could probably talk about this all day, but we're up against the clock. Where can people reach out to you? BKBeauty.com. I'm on Twitter. DCC Twitter is a great place. And ECF, I've really enjoyed getting connected with the folks out there. I was out in LA last week at one of their regional events. Yeah. So yeah, if you're in the space, look at ECF. I love to yeah, connect Andrew, there as well. Andrew puts on a good group. What's your Twitter handle? Paul Howdigy. So it's my name. And how do you spell your name? So last name spelled J-A-U-R-E-G-U-I. There you go. Paul, thanks for coming back and sharing your affiliate magic. I'm excited to uh, maybe have you back on in a year where we can talk about how we uh, destroyed it or got destroyed in affiliate marketing as well. All right. This Thank has you. been another e-commerce conversations. Hope you guys took a couple nuggets away. I know I certainly did. Cheers. Keep on growing. Wow.